and she's the author of Heart of the Spring series. She has, uh, has been blessed to be in Bennett Spring president and a freelance writer for over 30 years. She has written more than 500 newspaper and magazine features, including several on the history of the state park. She is the author of two nonfiction books and two previous novels. She and her husband, Warren, recently retired from the Missouri Department of Conservation and are the parents of four grown children and grandparents of five grandsons, all who still love to fish at Bennett Springs. Um, the Heart of Spring is also available on her website, and we would like to read that. And now take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Well, um, I came here today uh, to talk about the Ozarks, but I'm, um, I don't know how many of you saw Miss Kelly's presentation when she was talking about culture and belonging and stuff like that. I hope several of you got to see it. It was really interesting. I'm a rare person, I guess, in that I grew up in three different cultures. And for many, many years, I really envied people who had always lived in the same place, in the same town, and knew exactly who they were, where they grew up, if they grew up in Lebanon, Missouri, or they grew up in a city or wherever, but they knew exactly who they were. I grew up in the city of St. Louis, but also on my grandparents' farm. And in the 1950s and 60s, there was a huge divide between those two cultures. And what I mean by that, some of these things, like this butter churn here, it's from my grandma's farm. As a kid, I churned butter. As a kid, I sat on the floor and wrapped my legs around that but in the summertime because it was cool, and the cream was cool, and then we churned and churned and churned. My sister and I traded off, you know, and it was always grandma's are ready yet, grandma's are ready yet. And, and so, but that was very different from the life that I lived in St. Louis. And I remember even starting kindergarten in St. Louis. Um, on the farm, my grandma called me Larley, and my sister was Terry Lynn, because my name is actually Larley. Larley, and she was Terry Lynn. The boy next door was Charles Wright, and his mother was Mary Lou. Now, if you didn't have two names in that community, Something was wrong. Either your parents were not very imaginative that they couldn't come up with two names. I mean, if you came to town and said your name was Mark or Cindy, people white for the other part of your name. Everybody had two names. So when I got to St. Louis as a kindergarten, I remember very clearly the first time turning around and saying something, well, I'm going outside. And I said, Well, y'all coming outside? And everybody stopped dead in their tracks and said, well, you all, we don't know exactly what you're doing, you know. So, but I mean, right there, I got told, oh my gosh, there is a huge between these two places. And we're like, 120 miles apart. In the meantime, my father, who was a gypsy, not the Romanian kind with the gold ring in his ear, but the kind of guy who was the fifth son of a dirt farmer in southeast Missouri who wanted. Prestige and money. That's what his two ideas of success. Went to St. Louis and became a businessman and did that, made money. And so then he traveled. By the time I was seven years old, I was through Mexico and I was time 11, I was in the Yucatan in a Willie's Jeep. I don't know if you all have ever seen a Willie's Jeep. You've seen them also on museums. They're about two thirds the size of a regular Jeep. And you look at that little back seat and it's like this big. My sister and I spent seven weeks bouncing around, no seatbelts, of course, in the back of a Willie's Jeep, traveling through the Yucatan where the highway had been paid six months before. You've heard a couple of these African American ladies talk today about people touching their hair. Well, let me tell you something. When you're a 10 year old kid going through Mexico, yes, very much that experience. The little old ladies would get you in the market and they were like, Mira su pelo tan lisito, vera, y los ojos tan claritos, vaya, and they're touching your hair, and they're grabbing your face, and they're looking in your eyes, and at first it scared me to death because they didn't understand what they were saying, and then I came to start to listen and realize everything they were saying was really lovely. What they were talking about is how clear and green, greenish blue my eyes were, because the only eyes they had ever seen were called black, and that my hair was, was lisito which is like smooth and, and slick, but, but it was light, you know, because all the hair they saw was coal black and thick and heavy. So, you know, I got pawed all over. And I didn't have a chance to tell anybody, don't touch my hair. But anyway, they were, they were pretty funny. And everything. But I got to know very quickly that they were friendly. But I grew up then in and out of Mexico. Entonces yo hablo español sin problema. 
but it also throws people, when I go back to Latin America, or even here when I meet Latin American people, I had a Mexican girl I was translating for one time, she looked at me, she goes, your Spanish does not match your face. <laughs> so it throws people, it throws people there, the taxi drivers used to ask me, okay, you look like a gringa, but you talk like us, what's the story here? So, I've grown up in three different cultures, but I'm here today to talk to you primarily about the Ozarkian culture, which in a great way is the culture I was born to. I was born to the Ozarkian culture, but then my father, like I said, went to St. Louis and became you know, successful in business. I can remember very clearly him paying to put water into the farmhouse when I was 12 years old, which meant for the very first time in the farmhouse, we had an indoor bathroom, which my grandmother was thrilled about because now she had she told, I heard her tell somebody one time that was visiting from the city, before that you took a bath, you took a bath in a basin in the sink. And they said, well, you know, they're standing there going, you know, you don't have a bathtub. She said, no, you take a basin in the sink. And I said, well, how? And she said, well, it's real simple. You wash down as far as possible, and you wash up as far as possible. And then you take that water and you throw it out as possible. <laughs> and that was her idea of how, how you took a how you bath back then. So we got a... Uh, they had to make the bathroom out of the pantry, which was off the dining room because the house was not built for a bathroom. So it had a large pantry pot up the side of that. That's what they made the bathroom out of. So we got a bathtub. Grandma was thrilled. We got an indoor toilet. Grandma was thrilled. Grandpa was not. Why would you want that smell in the house? You used the outhouse to the day they moved off the farm. And besides that, you got to buy a paper just to throw it away. That's what the Montgomery Ward's catalog is for. You take that from the outhouse and you don't pay for paper. And that was his day. Now that's a real stretch from St. Louis, and probably the way most of y'all have grown up. You always have toilet paper, right? You never hang the catalog. So we had butter churn. Now we did not have. We were above this washing machine, but some people still use that with the with the uh, washboard and so forth to wash clothes. Until we got water in the house. We had a tub that was a little bit bigger than that, and that is what my sister and I took a bath in. My grandma would fill it up with warm water, and it would be behind the stove, and then grandpa was told to stay out of the kitchen, and that's what we took a bath in. So it was, it was a little bigger one than that. But we had some wonderful things about Ozark culture. Ozarkian people, you know, didn't have much, and poverty was certainly a part of it. But they were not people who sat around and felt they were poor or thought about being poor. They made things from what they had. You know, a walking sticker cane was made from the branch of a cedar tree. They wove baskets. They wove rugs. Now these are placemats. These were made, I don't know, some of you I'm sure have heard the name Ellen Gray Massey. She was a well-known writer in this area, historian and so forth. And she had one of those huge looms that you've just probably seen in the street that was really, really big and that you could weave on and she wove rugs and she wove these platforms, these placements as well. But if you see one of these, the rugs just look just like this, but they were just much larger. And uh, anyway, and I had one of the rugs and somewhere along the line I lost it and you didn't talk, which was real disturbing to me. So her daughter was kind enough to give me these placements. And but the rugs looked just like it and then, like I said they were wove on a big balloon. And again, these were things literally the poor people made. And we would look at those people today and say, oh my gosh, they just didn't have anything. My uncle made toys for the kids. You know, I think he made stools. His um, son, my cousin, made this from a mulberry tree. So we have just, you know, a lot of those different things. And I have written four novels. I've lived for the last 40 years at Bennett Spring. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Bennett Spring. And I wrote four historical novels on the history of Venice Springs, starting in 1924. Venice Springs was the first state park in Missouri, and it was they bought the first land for it uh, December 27th, so four days before the end of the year. In 1927, they bought eight acres. They bought it from a woman who owned a little, um, like a boarding house there. <coughs> And her brother actually owned the majority of the land, and they wanted the land from her brother. But when he heard that the state was interested in buying it for a state park, he immediately jacked up the price. So then the state, the state people backed out and said, well, maybe we're not going to do this after all. Well, sister went ahead and sold her land on December 27th, and brother came around by April of 1925 and sold the land. So that was the beginning of the state park. 
um, 500 and some acres by William Sherman Bennett. And today it still carries the Bennett name in the Spring State Park. And it was from Josie Bennett Smith, his sister. So I wrote um, a novel about that, and I don't know if y'all are familiar with historical novels. If not, they're great. Because you read a novel, a story, but in a historical novel, the history is accurate. So while you're reading a story, just having fun, kind of like watching you know, a television episode or whatever, watch the history that you read about at the time is accurate so you can read the history book. Because if somebody says, well, I need you to read this history book, what do we all do? Oh my goodness, you know, we'll be asleep in 10 minutes. But if you get to read a novel, you get to read a story and the history comes along with it. And I've written four. Um, the first one was The Heart of the Spring, and that's when the park started. And the next one is The Heart of the Spring Lives On. And that was set in 1935. If y'all have been to the park, you've seen the triple arch bridge, all the stone that's put on that. That was put on by a group called the CCC. They're also the ones that built the dining lodge. And I wrote a story about people working at CCC. The CCC was kind of like, if you think of summer camp, anybody ever been to church camp, summer camp? CCC was a little bit like that, but they fed you three times a day, and it was all young men, and they gave them uniforms, and they put them up in cabins and tents and so forth. They built barracks, and then they built things. They built your state parks. They built a lot of your first highways, trails, all kinds of things. When you go to state parks, um, say in Missouri, and then you go to a state park in Wisconsin, and if you look around, you're like, well, the buildings kind of all look the same. They're very similar. That's because all of the plans came out of Washington, D.C. at the time, in the 1930s. But they were built all over the country. And what the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, what it really did was save the lives of thousands of people in the Midwest. Because the farms had failed, there was literally no food, there was a horrible drought. People had nothing to eat, and people were starving right here in the Midwest. And if you study the history of it, you'll find out that hundreds were in dire need, and literally without the CCC, thousands would have died. And what they did is they formed the Civilian Conservation Corps. These young men would come and work at it, they would stay in these camps for up to two years. They would work every day, well, five days a week. They got paid $25, no, no, excuse me, $30 a month. They got paid a dollar a day. But the young men only received $5. $25 was sent home to their families, and they signed up. When they signed up, that's the way it was going to be. They got $5. But they didn't really need the money for anything except smokes or Coca-Cola and that because they were fed, they were clothed, and they had work to do. So they were taking care of kind of like trying to make But $5 went to them. $25 went home, and that money saved the lives of a lot of families. So when I wrote this book about the CCC, I thought, well, how do I make it a little different? Let's make it a little more exciting. And um, I thought, I had a young man that was already there at Bennett Spring in mind, and so I needed to bring a girl into the picture. But the CCC, all the people that were coming in, were, from, were young men. And I thought, it's actually documented history during the Civil War. They have at least 250 cases of women who dressed both as Union and Confederate soldiers, disguised themselves as men, and went to war with their brothers or their husbands. And that's 250 documented cases, so who knows, there might have been a thousand cases, but there were 250. I thought, you know, Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, was only 70 years later. What if I had a young lady? had a good reason to sneak into the CCC. So that's what I did in the book here. And what I did was she had a twin brother, and he had gotten an appointment to work in the CCC and was very excited because that money was going to help save their family. And the week before he was to leave, he broke his leg in a wagon, wagon accident. Well, you know, the federal government's still the same. He didn't want to go to the government anymore and tell him because then he figured his family would lose the opportunity and they really need that money. So he turned to his sister and he said, you know, you look enough like me. I've already passed the physical. I'm going to put a hat on you. I'm going to put a little dirt on your face. You keep a low profile. He said, I've seen your work. He says, you can do this for six weeks. You go as me. His name was Jesse. Her name was Jessica. He said, when they ask for Jesse, you just say, I'm just new. That ain't a lie. And he said, for six weeks, you can keep your head down. You can work and keep this spot. And when my life is better, then I'll come take your so that's what they did. And of course, those 
because she gets up there, somebody discovers her. So then they're trying to claim fraud, and she's like, no, 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 it's not like that. So that's the whole story there, and she works in the CCC undercover, so to speak. So you can just take history when you know history, and you can have great fun with it. Like in the first <coughs> book, when they were starting the park, there actually was in the Venice Spring area a group that didn't want them to do the park. They thought, no, 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 this isn't good because they knew they were going to lose the town of Bryce. If you've ever been down to the park, you've seen there was a little town there called Bryce, and they did lose it. It was right on the site of where the current park store is, and if you go down there and look, there's a big cedar tree right there. Well, that cedar tree was right there in the town of Bryce. Uh, the church that is there is the only building left from the town of Bryce. But anyway, so they wiped out the town. There were people that were like, no, 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 we can't have this. Well, the father of the young lady who's like the heroine in the story, he was the post, he worked for the post office there. He was the postal carrier. He said, no, no, we have to fight against them because they're going to wipe out our town. They're going to wipe out the post office. They're going to wipe out our job, my job. And the nice thing is when you know history, you can play with it a little bit. It's true. They wiped out the town of Bryce by the 1930s. But the Bryce Post Office actually continued in operation until the mid-1960s. And when I went there in the 70s, it was still called Bryce Route. A lot of my friends from like New York and Chicago, that's where my address, and my address was Laura Valenti, Venice Spring, Bryce Route, Lebanon, Missouri. And they were like, well, I can't be your full address. I said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, where's the numbers? you got to have numbers and an address for it to be real. I said, no, oh, but the guy who runs the Bryce route owes everybody on the route. <laughs> and it was really kind of cute, too, because every now and then we'd have a foreign student or something, and he knew that I lived overseas, and of course I got letters from overseas. So it got very quickly that any time there was anything that came with foreign writing or foreign postage on it, he didn't bother to see who it was. He just brought it to Laura. He said, whoever it is, she'll get it to him. So I did. And I delivered his stuff because he was like, oh, this is some, I can't read this. Thank you, Laura. She'll figure it out. So that's what we did. But, um, I would be glad to answer any of your questions anywhere along the way if you have any questions about how's their culture and so forth. Of course, over here I have a moonshine bottle and a book called Ozark Met, which I also wrote with a friend from Bolivar several years ago. I'm um, sad to say that meth and moonshine, and I was going to give me some oregano. I had oregano in my garden. I thought, I can put that in a little baggie. But anyway, <laughs> that is all part of our culture, too. And, and it's a sad side of our culture, but it's very, very real. I worked 10 years for the sheriff's department here. I ran the county jail for three and a half years. Now, I am a whopping five foot three in my boots. And I realize most people, when they say, well, the person that runs the county jail, they want to see Arnold Schwarzenegger. But, sorry, it's just a grandmother, 50-year-old grandmother running the jail. But it's amazing. I have... Four kids, all in a row. Today they are 38, 39, 40, and 41. When they were well, 13, 14, 15, my house was a hopping place. But I pretty much, and I had my nephew and my niece in the summer too, so I had six kids in the summer. And they asked me one time what was the best training you ever had for running a jail. And I said, running six kids in the summer and working at church camp. And I treated those boys in the jail just like I always did my own kids. I had more trouble with commissioners than I did over out of the inmates. You know, inmates kind of know their place pretty quickly. If you're going to have a surly inmate, they're surly within the first 24 hours. And generally speaking, if they give me any sass at all, before I can even say anything, another inmate turned around and said, you can't talk to her like that. But, like I said, if you've got questions about the Ozarks, or any of it, I think that would be this is your cultural home, uh -huh. and a lot of people don't realize that they have you know, a culture here too. As far as uh, the meth and the, the moonshine, you know, people don't think, well, why do we have such a problem with that? And, you know, I mean, they call meth 417 in California. You know, there's a reason for that. And the question is, why is it so prevalent in this area? And we studied that. Um, this book over here, Ozark Meth, we interviewed. 30 methamphetamine addicts in sustained recovery here in southwest Missouri. And they told us how they got on, how they got off, and how they stay out there. The question always came up, why here? Why us? We came up with really three answers. Number one, like it or not, it's part of our heritage. We are the land of Jesse James, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde used to stay right over here. It used to be called the Joy Motel, the Joy Camp. Um, it's like directly across from 
the uh, uh, Civic Center, kind of where the Lens Motel is. There was a camp there when I first came here in the 70s. There were still little cabins there. And my flight used to stay there quite often. Local law enforcement knew they were coming. They were there. And the deal was, you leave them alone. When they come to Lebanon, they behave themselves. They go over there. They're quiet. They raise all kinds of, <clears throat> down through Oklahoma and so forth, did their bank robbing and killing and that. When they came to Lebanon, they were quiet. And the sheriff here was just, and police chief were Because they had killed several law enforcement officers in, every, in other places, and they were pretty ruthless. When they came to Lebanon, they just let them all be. So we had Bonnie and Clyde, we had Jesse James, you know, that is our heritage. And those people, sad to say, in some ways were looked up to. People thought, well, they're really cool to get by with this stuff, you know, and rah, 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 rah. So that's our heritage. Also, we have here, and, and you all may are probably familiar with it in one form or another, the Ozarks is a place of extreme poverty at times. We have people still who come here, and they'll come visit from California or Colorado, and wow, this is beautiful, this is neat, they fall in love with Venice Spring, and they move here. And then what? The hardest thing when you move here is how do you make a living? Unless you are a professional, and you have a guaranteed job here, say you work for the Fed, like you work for the post office, my husband and I came here in 1979 because he was the new assistant hatchery manager at Ben Spring. And for 21 years, he raised trout here. So he had a good guaranteed job. You know, people would come here as teachers. They have a job like that. That's one thing. But people who just decide, oh, I'll just move to Ben Spring. I'll just move to Lebanon. And then what? Pretty soon they're working where? At Come and Go? At the Dollar, at the dollar General? Or <coughs> Wage? And all of a sudden they discover... But you know, there's this guy up the road, and he's doing a little, you know, stuff on the side, and we're not real specific about it. He's selling the stuff, and he's making money hand over fist. And suddenly, people who never had any desire or intention of ending up in the drug trade are there. And it's economics. The other part of it is the law enforcement quotient. We just had the sheriff here talking. Great, great gentleman. Um, when I worked for the Sheriff's Office from 1994 to 2004, the first three years I worked there, we were still in what was known as the old jail. There was a total of 15 employees at the county jail, and that included the jailers and me. 15 of us to police this whole county. Now, you think about people being on duty 24 hours a day. It was not uncommon that we had one deputy working the roads from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until 8 o'clock in the morning. There's almost 900 square miles in the Clean County. If you've got a deputy who's tied up with something in Eldridge and something goes wrong at the spring or competition, now what? Hmm. That's a long way. That's a 50 mile stretch from Eldridge to competition. It's going to take me an hour to get there. You know, somebody's breaking into your house and your life is threatened. You know, do you really want the sheriff to have to take a whole hour to get and that leaves the door wide open for people to be from marijuana, make meth labs out in the county, whatever. You can't do this all that. So you have, you know, a, very, a shortage of cops, wide open areas, people with not enough money, 